Let me share the screen. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, yes, we can see your screen. Oh, okay. Um, uh, what I'm presenting on uh, software attacks and the defenses is topic six, but this topic um, uh, I'm sharing with uh, Dennis, who is supposed to present on operating system attacks and then the, the defenses. We'll see, but uh, he, he say today is not there. Oh, okay, the, the attacks that we want to talk about are buff, uh, the software uh, attacks, buffer overflow, risk condition, and complete mediation. I don't think we we'll, we'll, we have time to do that. If you look at uh, more details, then it, it takes more time. Okay, I, I will start by, let's consider a typical scenario where an attack of a buffer overflow might okay. Suppose uh, that a web form asks the user to enter data, such as name, age, date, date of birth, and so on. This data is then sent to, to a server that writes the data to, to buffer that can hold n characters. If the server software does not verify that the length of the data is at most n characters, then a buffer overflow can okay because it is exceeding the space that is allocated. It is reasonably likely that overflowing data will cause a computer to crash and attackers could take, ad could take advantage of this launch to launch a denial of safe attack. So really buffer overflows are used to, to cause a denial of safe attacks because when it happens, the computer crashes. When it crashes, then there is no service. To, to understand the uh, buffer of flat attacks, we, we need to look at the memory architecture of a computer. In the PC architecture, there are four basic read-write memory regions in a program. What's called the stack data, BSS blocks started by symbol and the heap. The data, BSSS and HIP are collect, collectively, collectively referred to as the data segment. And let's look at the stack. Stack typically located in the higher parts of memory. It usually grows down from high address to low address. Stack is used whenever a function call is made. Oh, okay. Before I go proceed with this, maybe what I need to let my colleagues know is that buffer overflow attack affects its uh, affects language likes. Programming language commonly associated with buffer overflows include C and C++. Uh, these attacks, they are rare or will not be found in, in languages like Java, in Python, okay, they call them uh, strongly type languages. So you also need to know a bit of uh, integer types in, in, in C and how uh, coding takes place in, in the C and C++ language to understand how this buffer of overflow attacks okay. Okay, let's go to the data area. It contains global global variables used by the program that are not initialized to zero the data area uh, and then for instance the string hello world defined by the by char s then array they is equal to hello world in c would exist in the data part bss segment starts at the end of the data segment and contains all global variables that are initialized to zero. For instance, a variable declared static int i would be contained in the, in the BSS segment. 
we also have the hip uh, area begins at the end of the BSA segment and grows to large addresses from 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 there. The hip area is managed by memory allocation malloc. Yeah, I think yeah, I mean, that's what it means there for memory allocation. Let me repeat, going back to some definition, a buffer overflow occurs when a program or process attempts to write more data to a fixed length block of memory or buffer than, than the buffer is allocated to hold. And what is a buffer? A con contiguous block of computer memory that holds multiple instances of the same, same type, CRs. So contiguous, there is, we simply mean that it's continuous overflow what we mean by overflow to fill over the brim to fill more than full buffer oh, oh, yeah than the what the, the the buffer can hold happens when a, a program attempts to write data outside the memory allocated for that data now uh let me there are a lot of things that we need to cover i've told you about the programs that 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 the language that where this happens. Overflowing the buffer. Let me go to a program to show you first some of this stuff of, of, of registers and the stuff like that. You may need to have looked at it or revised, but let me just go to a program now, an example to show you the one that I have here. I have a program that's this the one that starts that's in board, which says int main that's in C. What we have is then we have below that we have declared uh char a character for a, then R A they we are putting a b c and then string copy is a function. Yes, this string copy is a function in C. Okay, then we have a the A that we have above here, where we've said char or character, and then we have PQRST. What we want to do below is to copy PQRST onto A, the A that has three spaces, but what we are copying into A is, is got five, is five, five, five uh, characters. So really, this will cause a buffer overflow because it cannot fit into it cannot fit into the space that that is allocated for a so it causes a buffer overflow when that happens uh usually if if the, there is no attacker who is taking advantage of this situation the computer simply crashes and causes a uh a, a denial of service it's a denial of service that occurs automatically why should we care? Because adjusting memory stores program variables, parameters, and arguments. So an overflow is overflowing to those other areas where the, we, we have program variables, parameters, and arguments. Attackers can change these values through overflowing a buffer. So, so also what we are saying is that an attacker can take advantage of a program, a buffer overflow, Okay, because it's errors in programming by programmers, which are in, unintentional. When the programmer was making the program, they made a mistake. Okay, so uh, let me go and see. Uh, attackers can gain control over the program flow to execute arbitrary code. Okay, let's come to the potential risks, risks of buff overflow. Buffer overflows can result in a wide range of security risks, including arbitrary code execution. One of the most severe consequences of a buffer overflow is the ability of an attacker to ex execute ab arbitrary code with the permissions of the affected process. This can lead to a complete compromise of the system, including theft of sens sensitive information. We spoke earlier about denial of service. I think this one you now understand. And I even gave an example of on a website. I, most of you have used that where you have to complete, you are putting in information, and then maybe 
when they were programming, they did not put that uh, bounds checking to, with, within the bounds so that the information, if it does not fit, then the program will simply reject and give you a, a, an error. So denial of service, a buffer overflow can cause a program to crash or hang, leading to denial of service. This can result in temporary or permanent disruption of service and can also cause a chain reaction that spreads to other systems and services. Information leakage, information leakage. A buffer overflow can allow an attacker to, act, to access sensitive information, such as passwords, encryption keys, confidential data stored in the affected process memory. Uh, elevation of privilege, a buffer overflow can allow attacker to gain elevated privileges on the affected system, potentially bypassing security controls and accessing sensitive systems and data. A general exploitation steps. How do we exploit a buffer overflow? We are saying that a programmer is made in a program with errors that would cause uh, the buffer to be to overflow because data that is being copied or put in, in the buffer or in the memory is more than the space that is allocated. First, what we need to do is to identify the vulnerability in the first step in exploiting buffer overflow. So this is what Yekas do. They would first investigate if there is a buffer overflow in a software. It could be software that was made by Microsoft or so software that is made, or even on routers. A router can have also that kind of error. There is a buffer overflow. So attackers will, will, will investigate and search for that. An attacker can do this through manual code review, automated vulnerability scanning, or other means. So there is a um, software that is used to, to scan uh, these softwares or applications for a buffer overflow. Craft the payload. So we have discovered that there's an error. We now need to craft the payload. Once the vulnerability has been identified, the attacker must craft a payload that will overwrite the buffer and redirect the program's execution flow to the attacker's code. An attacker must carefully construct this payload to, to bypass any security features such as uh, ASLR or DEP. You forgive me there, I'll, I'll check uh, what this acronym means. Just forgotten there. Injection. The payload is then injected into the buffer, usually through a network based attack vector, such as a ne network packet or web request. Triggering. The attacker must then trigger the buffer overflow condition, causing the program to write the payload to the buffer and overwrite the adjacent memory locations. Execution. Once the payload has been injected, once the payload has been injected and the buffer overflow has been triggered, the attacker's code is executed, allowing them to take control to, of the program and execute their desired actions. So this is how uh, we can take advantage of, or, of a buffer overflow. But the biggest way that, uh, we can exploit this buffer overflow is through, let me just go back. I wanted to uh, uh, highlight this one, what they call shell code. Shell code, I think this applies to the Linux, Linux system. Maybe, uh, I don't know maybe any other systems, but in, 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 in Linux, where you, be, you become the, the root user and the root user, there is all the powers to do anything that they want. So in this section, we discuss how to write such malicious code. If we can ask the privileged program to run our code, what code uh, do you want it to run? The most powerful code that we want it to run is to invoke a shell. So we can run any command we want in that shell. So you invoke a shell, you, you ask it uh, to invoke a shell. In the shell, you can run any process or any uh, code that you want. So that is what you do after taking control or changing the flow of the program, you then uh, able to instruct it to uh, run your, your program. To learn how to write a show code, let's see the following C program. 
I will, let's not waste much time here I, on how this is a generic program. It, it just as it is, this is how it is written, but we will not spend much time on uh, trying to understand this uh, show code program that, that is used by, by attackers. But if you are interested, you can look, you can go and, 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 and spend more time trying to see how, how that works. And let me move on to the next. We've spoken about the buffer, but there's the heap and the stake. Let's look at the stake. What 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 um, attacks happen in the stake? What this what is called stake smashing? Uh, just to confirm, are, are we at the same page about what we've discussed? On, on 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 the on the buffer overflow Hello? we are seeing this yeah it's oh, going well okay. yeah okay so we're on the same page let's move to stake smashing okay stake smashing sometimes referred to the stake is is on the that part of memory the buffer it's also a, a buffer overflow. There is a heap as well. There is heap overflow. So here we are looking specifically at the buffer overflow that is taking place on the stake. Okay, so when data exceeds its buffer boundary and over overwrites adjacent memory areas, if not detected and mitigated, this event can lead to a range of undesirable outcomes such as program crashes, cor corrupted data, or even malicious code execution. Smash. A stake smash attack, stake smash attack. Now, now that we have a grasp of stake smashing, what about this? Okay, let the, this term refers to malicious exploitation of the buffer overflow vulnerability. Cyber criminals use this method to inject and execute arbitrary code in a system. Here's how it really works. Okay, I think we have looked at this. The detection the attacker identifies a vulnerable program. One way user input isn't appropriately validated or bounded. So input validation is one important step that has to be used to ensure that this buffer overflow attack doesn't take place. You, you craft the payload execution control. We have discussed this. So really buffer overflow and the heap overflow, they are more or less the same, but they reside in, in different areas. Why should we care? Security buffer overflow can compromise system integrity, leading to unauthorized access or data theft. Even without malicious intent, stake smashing can result in unpredictable program behavior or crashes. Reputation security breaches, especially those affecting user data, can ir irreversibly damage a company's reputation. A mitigation. What steps can we take to mitigate the buffer overflow? The threat of stake smash is led to, uh, to numerous preventive techniques, bounds checking. By ensuring data doesn't exceed buffer limits, one can prevent overflow. Okay, so the bounds checking, when you are writing your program, you, speci you specify completely that if the characters are larger than this, then uh, you you uh, you say it's an error. You retain an error in the program when you are writing it. Non non-executable stake. Modern system can be configured to prevent the execution of code from the stake. So you make it impossible to for the code on the stake to be to be executed. Then what they what they call stake canaries. This involves placing a small random value, the canary between the buffer and control data. A mismatch in in its value can indicate a potential of alerting alerting alert, alerting the system. So there is a value there that you put, I think, in the stake. When when a, a stake overflow case, it first goes to the kernel. So that that is the one that will alert you that something has happened. Instead of going straight to your, to your important uh, data, which is which, which is also residing on the stake. So we have put something first, so where you get an alert if a stake overflow, okay, before it 
goes on to import in that. The one that I was talking about, address space layout randomization. I, I gave you this one above. This is the acronym. This randomizes memory address, making it more challenging for attackers to predict where their code might reside. OK. Uh, in, a, in a practical lab where you are trying to perform, where you are trying to perform uh, a, a buffer for overflow attack, this randomization is already configured in, in, in say, in, in, in most systems. So what we have to do for you to perform this uh, buffer overflow attack you disable the this you disable this randomization address space layout randomization so that you, you are able to to know where the the code resides where it is without disabling disabling this uh address space layout randomization it will be difficult for you it will take someone who is very skilled to be able to to locate where the code resides so really uh maybe you take note of that Another, another type of uh, overflow that we have is what is called integer overflow. I, I told you earlier that the programs that are affected C and C++. So an integer type variable can, uh, can store zero positive and negative values without any decimal. In C, in C language, the integer data type is represented by the keyword int keyword and it can be both signed or unsigned by default the value uh is signed to an integer variable is considered positive if it is unsigned okay these data types in in c if it's signed you it, it can be positive or negative signed there's a negative there's a positive sign or negative sign for the sign. And signed, it is always positive. It is always positive. It starts, I think, from zero going up, taking only positive values. So that is these, these data types. You they will help you to understand this integer overflow, a flow or error, or the how the attack then takes place. An integer overflow is the condition that occurs when the result of an arithmetic operation, such as a multiplication or addition exceeds the maximum size of the integer type used to store it. When an integer overflow occurs, the interpreted value will appear to have wrapped around the maximum value and started again at the minimum value, similar to a clock that represents 13 as 1 p.m. as 1. OK, I'll, I'll try some further examples below will show you how to better understand this but in programming as i as you have all done when you are doing with uh dealing with uh databases you know that you have to specify uh so say is is it data type here so really that is important here my examples that i'm going to give you below here will, will make it much clearer how this thing works in in c for example, an 8-bit signed integer on most common computer architectures has a maximum value of 127 and a minimum of 128. If a programmer stores the value 127 in such a, in such a variable and adds 1 to it, the result should be 128. However, this value, however, this value exceeds the maximum for this type. So the interpreted value will wrap around and become will become minus 128. So instead of because it's limited to 127, it goes back to the first to the, the, the lowest figure, which is minus 128, instead of going to, to 128, a positive figure. Uh, here's an example. I hope you see the code that I'm having here. Let me just try to. Uh, we are trying to control integer overflow checking and see there is what we have here is the errors that that happen is we say if a 
we have a program here. We are adding, we are trying to add integer A and integer B. Okay. What we don't want, what we want to, 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 to what we are trying to do here is to avoid a result that does not make sense. So we are saying if we have A and B there, if A plus, we, we have A that is greater than zero and B that is greater than zero. So the result that we expect when we add A and B, it should be greater than zero. If we find A plus B, being less than or equal to zero, we should abort because that 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 result doesn't make sense. It it shows that there is an error somehow. Else, if a is less than zero and b is less than zero, and then we add, we should not get a, a result that is greater than zero. It shows us that there is an error. So this is the problem that 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 that, that happens with the uh, integer overflow. We, we, we you are adding two figures. That you expect maybe to, to bring out a positive value, like the one I've already shown you above there, that we have added 127 plus one, and then the result is becoming negative 128. You want to avoid that because of these uh, uh, in the, the data types or moving, changing from one data type to another. Uh, um, just to give you an example, Boeing 787 integer overflow, maybe I'm, from my reading, it says that uh, uh, Boeing once gave a notice that they did this problem. We have been advised by Boeing of an issue identified during laboratory testing. So they, they are saying it was in a lab test. The software counter internal to the generator control units will overflow after 240 days of continuous power, causing that uh, GCU to go into fail safe mode. If the four main GCUs associated with engine mounted generators were powered up at the same time, after two after 240 days of continuous power, all GCUs will go into fail safe mode, resulting in a loss of all AC electrical power regardless of, of flight phase. So just imagine that uh, the software in a in a plane. And then the, 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 this thing happens. It can result in something that is very serious if these type of errors are not taken care of. Okay. So really, uh, let me move on to security, security impact of integer operations. Attackers can use these conditions to influence the value of variables in ways that the programmer did not intend. The security impact depends on the actions taken based on those variables. Examples include, but are not limited to the following. An integer overflow during a buffer length calculation can result in allocating a buffer that is too small to hold the data to be copied into it. A buffer overflow can result when, when that data is copied. When calculating a purchase order total, an integer overflow could allow the total to shift from positive value to negative one. This would, in effect, give money to the customer in addition to their purchases when the transaction is completed. So you see the consequences of this integer overflow, how catastrophic they are. Another example, withdrawing $1 from an account with a balance of zero could cause an integer underflow and yield a new balance of, I think this is 4 billion. See, look at the, at the, at the error, what it, it, could, it, could, it would cause. Uh, 4 billion is, uh, is the maximum value, I think, under this data, data type. It ranges from maybe zero up to, up to four. So it, it goes on to the maximum figure. That, 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 that is there. You can check for data types in, in C. You will see, you see where, where the ranges for, the, for these uh, uh, data types, where it, it, the, the, their ranges, they will show, you will see this one, this figure. You might be wondering where I got the, this figure from. So you can check, like the one, the example that I gave you above here, we had, uh, we had, we had, uh, Minus, we had 128, 127 and, and minus 128. 
So that one is also uh, the limit or the range. A very large positive number in a bank transfer could could be cast as a signed integer by a back end system. In such case, the interpreted value could become a negative number and reverse the flow of money from a victim's account into the attacker's into the attacker's account. Uh, preventing defects in integer operations. Preventing defects in integer operations requires that the software developer anticipate or respond to these conditions. The best practices for doing so can be summarized in two main actions. First, choose an integer type used for a variable that is consistent with the functions to be performed. In some cases, one can avoid integer overflow by choosing an integer type that can hold all possible values of a calculation. In all cases, the proper integer type reduces the need for integer type casting, a major source of defects. So type casting, that we are moving from one integer uh, type to another, say from signed to unsigned. You try to add a number that is negative and a number that is positive. One has to be transformed first to the other type so that it can then result in errors. Uh, I hope you understand this. You have done this when you are doing databases where you are where you have to state the choose the data types. There are data types that can hold all types of values. So it will be safe to choose that one instead of being too specific. When 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 you choose a data type that holds all values, maybe the disadvantage is that it takes it takes more memory than where you are being too specific. You, you want to save your memory. But also there's that danger that then it can result in integer uh, overflows. Second, the operand of an integer operation or the result of it should be checked for overflow conditions. Okay, like what we have done above, or the example that I showed you above. Checking the result attempts to determine whether an exceptional condition is occurred after the fact. For example, if A and B are both unsigned, integers then a plus b should is less than a should never be a true in normal operation if it is one could assume that an integer overflow is okay unfortunately compilers have been known to optimize such okay let's leave that one we have i've given you an example in one program above it is considered safer to check the operands of the operation before the calculation uh, okay, let's move on to th those. Uh, I would say are the are the measures that can be taken to prevent. Uh, let's move on to format string attacks. Another type of attack that happens. Format string attacks alter the flow of an application by using string formatting library features to us to access other memory space vulnerability is okay when user supplied data are used directly as formatting formatting string input for certain c and c plus plus functions eg f print f print f s print f uh, i hope you are you are you are familiar with this string formatting uh, functions in, in 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 c and c plus plus but you also find string formatting in in almost all the other languages if an attacker passes a format string consisting of print f conversion characters eg uh, percent, this percentage f and the percentage p and so on is a parameter value to the web application they may execute arbitrary code on the server read values of the stake cause segmentation faults or software crashes the one that i know is is, is i think for integers yeah it's uh it's f w the percentage if there is for float and when we have d then we're saying it's, it's percentage d is supposed to mean it's an integer float yeah this one is a float eg i hope you refresh your memory on on, on this stuff to understand it better Format string attacks are related to other attacks in the 
threat classification, buffer overflows, and integer overflows. All three are based on their ability to manipulate memory or its interpretation in a way that contributes to an attacker's goal. Example, let's assume that a web application is a parameter email address detected by the user. The application prints the value of this variable by using the printf function. If the value sent to the email address parameter contains conversion characters, printf will, will pass the conversion characters and use the additional surprise additionally supply, supplied corresponding arguments. If so, such arguments actually exist. Data from the stake will be used in accordance with the order expected by the printf function. The possible uses of format string attacks in such a case can be read data from the stake. If the output stream of the printf function is presented back to the attacker, he may read values on the stake by sending the conversion character where we have percentage x one or more times read character strings from the process memory if the output stream of the print a function is presented back to the attacker you can okay that one we have we have covered what are the advantages of uh, format string exploits to attackers no need to smash the stake the one that we have discussed above smash attacks Avoid defenses such as stack canaries. That we spoke, spoke about that. Stack canary is a random word pushed onto the stack that is checked before the function returns. And then the disadvantages of uh, the disadvantages of string exploits is it's tricky to exploit compared to buffer overflows. They are not easy to exploit, easy to catch, so rare. So and they are also easy to catch. But at the same time, they are not easy for you to, to craft it and, and exploit a, a string, uh, uh, a format string, OK? So really, those are, 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 are the disadvantages. Uh, they are practical, a practical demonstration. Of, OK, we will not go into that because we, we don't have the time. But for those who are interested, I think they can they can try this. I think there's an application that is called Vuln Saver. Uh, it's a command line Windows application. So our victim or the target OS will, will be a Windows machine, which will be attack which will be attacking using cow Linux. The ultimate goal of the attack is to gain access to the Windows machine for debugging purposes and looking at the registers and we'll be using immunity debug for shell code generation we'll use ms okay that one in net this uh, i think this application the entire attack is based on the following steps fuzzing the application to determine the crashing of the applic to determine the crashing of the application finding the exact location of the crash which is called the offset confirming the offset and control over the flow execution by overwriting the instruction pointer uh, we will not go into 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 the pra practicalities of carrying out a buffer of flow attacks i think I, I'll, I'll end here if if there's something that you want to ask i i i i give the floor to you yeah thank you thank you mr felix it was really a very good presentation you really managed to prepare well for this, okay? Oh, thank you, uh, sir. Please, I, 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 maybe, you know, I can, uh, yeah. You were saying? Okay, quickly, you know, I just, I just want to add some points here along with what you discussed, okay? So, uh, but you prepared well for the presentation. Thanks for the good presentation. Okay, and thanks. Is there any other questions from, yeah. Is there any other question from anyone? So that let's hear from others so that I can add my points here. Okay, so maybe, you know, as you know that, you know, the buffer overflow is like, you know, it's a software coding error, right? Or it, you can say it's a vulnerable that can be exploited by the hacker. 
basically they do this for what is that to gain unauthorized access to the corporate system basically they do this you know it's it's very critical type of uh, you know attack because uh, it's like a software coding error or they will look at the uh, vulnerabilities that can be exploited exploit so that you know uh, they gain access right so also if you look at that the software error focus on buffer actually you know uh, this uh, buffer like a buffer overrun buffer overflow occurs when the amount of data in a buffer exceeds its storage capacity for example if you have an array array you know you would have studied about an array in c and c plus plus right array array is like you know it has a continuous memory location where you say like uh, you can have different types of array like integer character float as uh, felix was telling like uh, different data types right he said also how to represent the data like uh, percentage d percentage f okay so those some see data type i hope you would know that it is of data integer as a capacity of uh, you know uh, four four bytes and then also float okay characters one byte so like that we have different data types with the different capacity so what will happen here is they basically you know target on uh, buffer size and then you know what will happen here the buffer over and a buffer overflow occurs when amount of data in a buffer exceeds its capacity the extra data what will happen you know it will be overflown into adjacent memory location and then uh, and correct or overwrite the data in the, those locations. So when you overload uh, a data uh, which uh, you know overflows, it can be uh, going to the adjacent memory. You know when you read a computer system architecture, you would have studied okay how or, or else you would have studied C or C plus programming like call by value call by reference. When you store your data in the memory, it happens like you know it memory location be created and then the data space will be created for each and every data what you store. So what will happen is these attackers are trying to, you know, uh, overrun or overflow the buffer so that it will uh, overrun other memory location and corrupt the data. And then, you know, what will happen? Like a uh, buffer overflow attack take place and attack manipulates the coding error, right? Also, they carry out malicious action, compromising the affected system. So most buffer flow, buffer overflow are caused by the combination of multi uh, manipulating memory and mistaken assumption around the co composition of size of data. So, uh, like, um, very, it's very simple to understand. Like, you know, uh, there are a lot of buffer overflow attacks. Uh, for example, like uh, including like uh, additional code into your program, it could be sent in as a new instruction that gives the attacker access to the organization IT system. So, this is one type of uh, example attack. Also, uh, attackers use buffer overflow to corrupt a web application actually for execution, execution stack, execute of arbitrary code, or also take over a mission. So, those are the flaws uh, in buffer overflow can exist in both application servers as well as web servers. And typically, uh, especially, you know, web application that uses the libraries like uh, graphics libraries. See, also, you should understand here yeah, buffer overflows can also exist in customs web application code this is likely you know because they give less scrutiny by success team security team also there are some consequences you need to also understand in terms of uh, buffer overflow attack like a uh, system crashes and the access control loss so basically you know yeah, when a, a buffer overflow attack will typically lead to the system crashing it also results in lack of availability and the program being put on an infinite loop so these things will definitely uh, will lead to the system crashes. Also, when you look at the access control loss, a buffer overflow attack will often like involves use of arbitrary code, which often outside the scope of the program, uh, also the security policies. So these are the very critical things like the system crashes and then access control losses are the, you know, some of the consequences you may have, uh, like, you know, uh, in terms of uh, what is that buffer overflow attack also mr felix was talking about stack based uh, buffer overflow heap based buffer overflow also there is a format string attack as well in different types of attack see what are the programming languages also we should understand here because basically this overflow attack uh, they are targeting for the code right so basically you know when you use a programming languages like a c c plus plus okay uh, these are the particularly pro problematic in programming language because they they are usually right using a lot of you know uh, they have buffer overflow they don't have but buffer overflow protection but in like a pro environment by like you know uh, the environment 
that are written in interpreted languages like a java and python or you mean to that type actually with the exception of overflow in their interpreter so uh, some of the languages like you know the the the, the more vulnerable okay we will we'll see c and c plus plus are more vulnerable for that and then also you know uh, there are a lot of uh, prevention method for this uh, buffer uh, overflow attack so there they there is a saying like you know address space layout randomization that is aslr that's a buffer overflow attack typically needs to know where executable code is located so uh, modern operating system they try to come up with various measures to prevent this uh, what is it buffer overflow attack uh, like also data execution prevention also like we have a structured exemption uh, ex uh, exception handling or overwrite protection schop uh, there are a lot of measures put in place to overcome this uh, buffer overflow attack and then uh, mr felix also gave some examples right like a character buffer and then they have some size they're trying to over uh, rewrite on that and then they try to make infinite loop also they may maybe uh, increase the you know uh, the example of what you were showing those are some of the very good examples that we need to understand about this uh, buffer overflow and then also uh, why this buffer overflow is vulnerable because you know it's not again the buffer overflow memory storage capacity right which overrides the memory data so that's that's that why that's that is it's not vulnerable because uh, also if you look at this uh, buffer overflow attack how it works when attacker manipulates a coding error to override the computing memory they can carry out malicious actions like uh, stealing data and compromising the system finally you know to adding this a uh, buffer over stack overflow is a like you know a software coding error like a attacker can use to exploit a vulnerability and gain unauthorized access to the proper system so basically you know this uh, buffer overflow attack uh, i will share a video with you please go through uh, uh, you will find uh, that is one of the video which i, I was uh, learning uh, when i was doing my cyber security course it, it, it was a very good video where you can watch that uh, i will be attending that class uh, you will find how the buffer overflow is done i will share the video link with you please go through that so on the whole uh, mr felix uh, really appreciate that you have done a very good job uh, in terms of the presentation thank you very much oh, okay uh, just to add something sir yes yes mr felix i, I just want yeah the morris swim is is one example of uh, the exploitation of 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 the buffer overflow if you mm -hmm. hit about the, yeah it was in the code the, the buffer overflow is uh, the era of the or flow of the decade but it's, it's, it's still existing in, even up to now and it's being used to attack systems thank you Michelle. any other any other points you want to add no i i think that's all for the the, thank you. the measures that that are taken maybe if it's possible we, we, you will not be using you mentioned uh, that uh, java and uh, saying python if you can use those languages instead of using c and c plus plus then mm -hmm. you will not be affected by this buffer overflow but system, for operating systems and uh, mm -hmm. some embedded systems you have no choice you have to use c and c plus yes, plus yeah, yeah exactly yeah 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 that that's a fair point yeah 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 any any other thoughts you have please others uh, along with you, Mr. Felix, who is presenting today? The other guy was supposed to present his code, Dennis, but he said he's, he just told me that, he, that he's, not, he's not able to make it today. Okay. I can present, sir. Ah, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Yeah. Mr. Jackson, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Felix, for the your presentation. Okay, let me stop sharing now. Yeah, please do that. Please give space to him. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen yes please yes. ok 
can you see my screen now yes please yeah we can see your screen yes okay cryptography yeah yes i'm going to present on cryptograph and blockchain um so basically cryptograph is the practice and study of secure communication techniques that protect information by transforming it into a readable, unreadable format, which is ciphertext, and then back to its original form, which is plain text, through the use of uh, mathematical algorithms and keys. So it's basically uh, a science of securing information by transforming it into an unreadable form. And it, um, it is essential for protecting sensitive data, such as passwords, personal information, or confidential transactions. Cryptography involves various techniques and algorithms to achieve these goals. Uh, I will look at the uh, cryptograph techniques. Um, so uh, what cryptograph techniques does is they provide data security to ensure that the data transferred between communication parties is confidential. It's not modified by an unauthorized part, which is a hacker, or it also prevents hackers from accessing and using their information. Um, these techniques, they deal with various security principles, which are as follows. Um, the first one is confidentiality. Uh, these techniques, they make sure that space, uh, it specifies that only the sender and the recipient or the recipient should be able to access the message. Then uh, another one is authentication where it identifies a user and a computer system so that it can be trusted. Another one is integrity. It checks that a message content must not be altered during its transmission from the sender to the recipient. Then another one is non-repudiation. It specifies that the sender or a message cannot be refused having sent it later on in a case of a dispute. So I will look at the techniques. Uh, we have the symmetric encryption uh, what symmetric, encry symmetric encryption uses a single shared secret key for the, for both encryp encryption and decryption. The same key uh, is used for is used by both the sender uh, and the receiver. Uh, we have well known symmetric uh, encryption algorithm, which is uh, AES Advanced Encryption Standard and DES data encryption standard. Um, and also we have TOS and SSL protocol. Uh, the major drawback of uh, symmetric encryption uh, is sharing the secret key. The secret key must be encrypted to prevent unauthorized access. It can be an additional overhead for cryptography application. Then we have uh, asymmetric encryption or public key, it can also be called public key cryptography, which uses uh, a pair of mathematical, mathematical related keys, a public key for encryption and a private key for decryption. Um, Well-known algorithms for asymmetric encryption include RSA and EEC, um, Crypto asymmetric encryption uh, helps to resolve a key exchange problem of the symmetric key cryptograph. In asymmetric encryption, two keys are used to encrypt print text through the internet or big network. The secret keys are exchanged. It is necessary to know that anyone with a secret key can decrypt the message. So asymmetric encryption uses two corresponding keys to increase safety. Then we have the hash functions. Uh, the hash function is another technique which take input data to produce a fixed hash value or digest. Hash functions are used for various purposes, include data integrity, verification, password storage, and digital signatures. Commonly used hash tag functions include SHA-256, which is secure hash algorithm, and MD5. Then we also have digital signatures. Digital signatures provide authentication, integrity, and non-repudiation for digital message or documents. 
digital signals are created using private key or asymmetric key P and can be verified using corresponding public key. Uh, well known algorithm are RSA and DSA digital signature algorithm. Then we have the steganography. Uh, steganography uh, is a technique that facilitates the hiring of a message that is to be kept secret in another message. Uh, long ago, people used to use uh, invisible ink uh, to hide information. But nowadays, uh, we, we, they can use steganography uh, to hide information. I will, maybe I will show you how the steganography uh, works. Um, let me open the steganograph too. I'll stop sharing. Um, you, where is the presentation? Right. You are still seeing my presentation? No, no. I, we can't see your presentation. Okay, let me reshare, reshare it again. Okay. Can you see the steganograph too? Yes. You are seeing it. So yes, yes, open, we can see that. Okay. So when you open a steganograph too, uh, uh, these are the options that you see. Uh, we have hide and hide and unhide. So we want to hide our data inside uh, another data. So to do that, we click on hide. And then, are you still seeing my screen? No. Okay, let me share it again. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, once we click on hide data, we'll get here where we are asked to, to for, so the first three columns here, uh, you have to put the password. But for this presentation, I will just use, I will untick this so that I can just use one password. Um, then I have to select the, the first thing is I put the password that can be used to decrypt uh, uh, the message or the, the data which is containing data which is hidden. So I will put a password here. So that I can remember, and then I click add. Um, I'm going to add a picture. I want to hide uh, text inside the picture using the steganograph tool. Uh, let me look for a picture that I can use. Right, I've added the picture. Now I want to add that text that I want to hide inside the picture. Then I have to click uh, here uh, where it says browse. Let me look for a text document. Let me use this one, uh, new text document too. So after doing this, um, what the steganograph will do using it, uh, an algorithm it will hide that text document that I just added to 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 that picture. Then I click hide, and then uh, I choose the location where I want the picture to 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 appear. So let me select downloads. So uh, that picture is now 
that picture it's now being stored in my downloads and it's containing an important message which is hidden in that picture so to let's say maybe i send that picture to someone and in order to see that message uh he has to then use steganograph 2 again um He has to use the steganograph tool again. This time he has to use the unhide to click unhide, and then uh, he puts the password that we 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 that we would have given him that we used to encrypt that message. So I put the password here. And then I I add the image, that image that we uh, we saved in our download, which we said it was containing uh, important information. I can't find that image, but uh, if I if I put that image and the password is correct and I click decrypt that message. I'm going to be able to see the message that have been encrypted. I guess I you, you managed to see how the steganograph works. So I will go back to my presentation now. So I will talk about um, implementing cryptograph mechanism. So the first thing is uh, you have to choose the right cryptograph algorithm. There are various uh, different algorithms um, which can be used, but you have to choose an algorithm depending on the use case and um, you have to choose the algorithm that meet your security requirements, performance goals, and compatibility standards. And you should also avoid uh, using outdated algorithms, uh, such as MD5, uh, SHE1. So you have to, uh, the second thing is generate cryptograph keys. Uh, when generating, uh, Cryptograph algorithm often require one or more cryptograph keys to encrypt and encrypt the data. So key management is a crucial aspect in cryptography. Uh, keys can be symmetric, that is the same key can be used for encryption, encryption and decryption or asymmetric, a pair of keys, uh, public and private is used. The length of key is important for security. The longer the keys, are usually uh, longer keys are generally more secure but may be slower to use another uh, point is implement in encryption and decryption and decryption manage uh, you have to manage the keys properly throughout the life cycles because keys are the secret ingredients that make cryptograph work so there is uh, they may need to be generated stored distributed rotated rotated and revoked securely and efficiently uh, following the principle of least privilege and give access to keys uh, only to those who need them and depending on the algorithm and programming language uh, there are certain libraries and apis that can perform encryption and decryption and decryption Another key point is to ensure data integrity. 
valid date of inputs and outs before and after applying cryptographs. Check uh, that inputs are well performed, sanitized, and authorized. And also that outputs are consistent, complete, and authenticated. And to be able to handle errors or exception that may occur during cryptograph operations. Uh, another important point is to test and review your code. Testing and reviewing your code through regular use of automated tools and frameworks to perform unit testing, integration testing, penetration testing on your cryptograph code. And you can also use uh, code analysis tools to review uh, tools and code review platforms to check any vulnerabilities or bugs or bad practice in your code. And you should be also, you should stay updated and informed um, with the latest developments and trends in cryptograph. Cryptograph is a dynamic and evolving field that constantly faces new challenges and opportunities. So to keep an eye on the latest research and news events in cryptograph and learn from the best practice and experiences of the developers and experts. Implementing cryptograph mechanism. Okay, I'll talk about cryptograph modules and processors. Cryptograph modules and processors are hardware or software components designed to perform cryptograph operations. Uh, they play a pivotal role in ensuring data security by handling encryption and encryption tasks. Examples include hardware security module, module, modules like uh, HSM and encryption libraries and integrated processor instruction for encryption. Then we also have uh, SSH Secure Shell uh, is a cryptograph network protocol for secure remote access, uh, data transfer, and command execution. It provides a secure channel over an unsecured network such as internet, ensuring um, confidentiality and integrity of data. SSH is essential for secure remote administration and secure file transfer. Then we also have um, Secure mode purpose internet mail extensions. Uh, it's a standard for securing email communications, providing message integrity and confidentiality. It uses a public key cryptograph to digitally sign and encrypt emails. Uh, secure mode purpose internet mail extensions ensures that mails are timber proof and can only be read by the intended recipient. Then we have the SSL and TSL secure socket layer transport layer security, which secure uh, data transmission over the internet, ensuring data privacy and integrity. Uh, they are used in web browsers, email clients, and many other applications. They provide trust and authentication for websites and applications. We also have um, public key infrastructure uh, which is a framework that manages digital keys and certificates for secure communication. It includes digital certificates, certificate authorities, registration authorities. Uh, PK is, a cru is crucial for ensuring trust and authenticity in online transaction, email, and more. And more. Then I will move on to blockchain. Uh, blockchain is a, it's a technology. Blockchain technology is a decentralized distributed ledger that maintains a list of transactions in a peer-to-peer -peer network in which um, security is provided using uh, cryptograph techniques. Um, these blocks are cryptographically connected and are secure over time. Uh, this technology has been used for maintaining cryptocurrencies cryptocurrencies and digital conducts and learned ownership in public records. So uh, 
in other words, a distributed data, a blockchain is a distributed database that maintains a continuously growing list of ordered records called blocks. And these blocks are linked using cryptography. And each block contains a cryptograph hash or a previous block, a timestamp, a transaction data. Uh, blockchain owes its name to the way it stores in transact data. In block linked to blockchain owes its name to the way it stores transact data in blocks linked together to form a chain. A number of transactions grows, so does the blockchain. Uh, each block contains a hash, which is a digital fingerprint or a unique identifier, a timestamp batches of recent valid transaction in the hash of the previous block. So uh, the previous blocks links the blocks together and prevent any block from being altered or the block being inserted between two existing blocks. So in theory, the, the method renders the blockchain timber proof. Uh, there are four concepts behind blockchain. Uh, we have the shared ledger. A shared ledger is an append only distributed system, append only distributed system of records shared across a business network. With a shared ledger, transactions are recorded only once, eliminating the duplication of effort that is typical of traditional business networks. Another one is permissions. Uh, permissions ensure that transactions are secure, authenticated, and verifiable with the ability to constrain network participation organization can easily combine with. Then we have the smart contract. A smart contract is an agreement um, or a set of rules that govern a business transaction. It's stored on the blockchain and it's executed automatically as part of transaction. Then we have the last one, which is the consensus. Through the consensus, all parties agree to the network verified transaction. Um, blockchains have various consensus mechanisms, including uh, proof of stake, uh, multi signature, and uh, practical, I, I just call it PBFT, full tolerance. Then we, uh, we have uh, participants in a blockchain. We have blockchain users. These are uh, participants with permission to join blockchain network and conduct transaction with other network participants. Then we have the regulators. Blockchain uses users with specific permissions to oversee the transaction happening within the network. Then we also have the blockchain network operators individuals who have uh, permissions and authority to define, create, uh, manage, and monitor blockchain network. Then we also have the uh, network, the certificate authorities. Uh, the certificate authorities, these are individuals who issue and manage different types of certificates required to run the permission to blockchain. Benefit of blockchain. Uh, a blockchain contains a database for recording transaction, but its benefits extend far beyond those of traditional database. Most notably, notably it removes possibility of tempering by uh, a malicious actor, as well as providing uh, some of the benefits like time saving, uh, blockchain slashes transaction times from days to minutes. Transaction settlement is faster because it doesn't require verification by a central authority. Cost saving, uh, the transaction need, transactions need less oversight. Participants can exchange items of value directly. Blockchain eliminates duplication of effort because participants have access to shared ledger. Tighter security. Blockchain security features protect against tempering and fraud, um, fraud and cybercrime. 
I will talk about uh, mobile cryptography. Mobile cryptography focuses on ensuring data and communication on mobile devices. It includes uh, encryption of data at rest and in transit, as well as secure authentication, as well as secure authentication methods. Mobile cryptography is, a vi is vital for protecting sensitive information on smartphones and tablets. Uh, selecting cryptography techniques based on requirements. So when, impl when implementing cryptography solutions, it is crucial to consider various factors such as security requirements, performance, and ease of use. The choice of uh, cryptography techniques should align with specific, specific security needs. I, I thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kitson, for your presentation. Good presentation. Uh, any one of you, any clarification, any doubts or any point you want to add to the presentation? Any, any Anything you'd like to add for this presentation? Okay. See, bit, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, on blockchain, I think he did a um, very good job there. I just want to add that at times, uh, depending on which side you are inclined to, but uh, uh, if you are uh, of the idea that uh, the, the financial world has to be liberated and there's no need for financial regulations, then blockchain would be the ideal thing. But if you are for regulations, like in the United States, where they are now having the Dudley and Frank laws to govern transactions, and they want everything to go through uh, the International Bank of Settlement using the SWIFT codes. It becomes so, uh, if, yeah, it becomes difficult for them to trace uh, transactions that they deem uh, funding maybe terrorism uh, or maybe anti uh, anti uh, capitalism agendas. So for them, blockchain at times it becomes a hindrance more than an advantage. And also due to uh, the fact that there is not really anyone, both is more like open and if anyone can be able to, to do whatever it is that they, 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 they want. Uh, that lack of uh, um, responsibility might uh, threaten other people and also divisibility in terms of uh, a transactional divisibility because at the moment like if you look at uh, some of the blockchain uh, currencies like eth 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 ethereum and maybe um, we've got the, the most common one the the, the, the bitcoin uh, its unit might be say one unit of bitcoin is equivalent to maybe at the moment maybe 32000 us so for you to to to, to be able to to transact in in that uh, with that that kind of uh, divisibility uh, for some it might be difficult and also it's uh, when when we are doing mining bitcoin mining it requires a lot of power to do that which might be a hindrance to other people but over and above it's a bit more secure uh, like you are saying, uh, fraudulent activities um, are, are, are minimal and due to its distributed uh, ledger kind of uh, nature, um, it, is, uh, it is bound to be in more, more, more regions. And uh, when, one, uh, when servers in one region fail, you can also be transacting using uh, the nearest uh, uh, edge 
a kind of a concept. So I think uh, you did a good job on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Shorwa. Thank you, thank you, Mr. for your pressing points. Any other topics? Anyone want to add to this? Yeah, basically, you know, you showed a very good example of technography also, right? Because technography always we hide information within an image, concealing the you know text inside the image. So cryptography, he also talked about cryptography, right? Cryptography means crypto means secret, graphy means writing. It's a secret writing. What we basically do is that we use, uh, what is that? We take a plain text message, we apply the encryption algorithm using the key, and then we decrypt, uh, so we encrypt, and then we send as a cipher text. The receiver end, they will receive as a cipher text. They need to apply the decryption algorithm, and they will decrypt the message to read the original message. So basically, we do this for the confidentiality, integrity. Okay, that's very important that we always focus on these things. I say CIA, CIA tried said confidential integrity and availability. So cryptography, there are several algorithms. You 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 learn like you know a public intuition algorithm or symmetric intuition algorithm. He was talking about AES, right? DES, AES, those things you call as a symmetric encryption algorithm. Asymmetric encryption algorithm is well known as the RS algorithm. So basically, we use these algor algorithms. What 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 is the purpose is that to take the plain text, convert into a cipher text, transfer. Because in a data transferring through network, there is a more possibility of attack on the data. So we use these algorithms to do this. And then also we do have a ash algorithm, ash function, right? Ash function is not similar to the what to say. Uh, uh, like encryption as function h equal to hfm is the function with the you know uh what do we do any given fixed length message you get you get a fixed length value this value is used to verify the uh, integrity of the data while sending the data you do the hash value and then after receiving the data you again compute the hash value if the both hash values are same you say the data is not tampered modification or altered Okay, so it's very important uh, to see uh, this data is, you know, what you send and what you receive the same. So we also use like a MD5 message digest file, uh, you know, mm, uh, mes message authentication code is there. And then also we use digital signature to identify who is sending the message as well. So uh, in cryptography, you will see that, you know, more, mostly cryptography is mostly bounded to the mathematical calculations. They use, uh, uh, what is that Com uh, permutation and combination to scramble the message and then they try to send the message to the receiver and then blockchain he was talking uh, about the you know uh, centralized ledger so see mostly you know this nowadays you know the cryptocurrencies everything we are moving towards the blockchain right it's it's one of the way that we can secure you know uh, you, you can increase the security that's what you'll, you'll see now that blockchain is coming up with a very, what to say, it, it is coming like anything because uh, uh, it, it is now, you know, what what had happened that uh, in the blockchain, you, you, you can't, you know, make any alterations, any changes, okay, because uh, it is like a pressure containing information about the transaction, right, and each transaction generates an hash, and as is, you know, the string of numbers and letters, transactions are entered in order, which the occur and uh, order is very important because ash depends not only on transaction but on the previous transaction ash also so it is more secure even a small change in the transaction creates a completely new ash so it is very very different and then you know uh, each block refers to a previous block and then also like a together they makes a blockchain so uh, why, why i'm telling this is uh, blockchain is now it has been very well used everywhere uh, like uh, also you have different type of blockchain right private blockchain and public blockchain the private blockchain you you know that it's faster always uh, managed upkeep and then also are trusted and are legal 
and then also you have public blockchain but it will be slower and then as a public ownership and then also like uh, open and transparent also trust free and this uh, those are the public blockchain is some but you know it, it has uh, you know some features as well as blockchain you know that you know it's very important because it opens a new world of possibilities with the numerous applications and high disruption potentials so also you know um most of the you know uh, you will see that most of the you know, organization they they try to adapt this blockchain so also there are some new courses you know offered in various university nowadays you will find it as in big data and blockchain technology that is also now coming up and then we need more number of blockchain uh, you know uh, experts who, who, who can work on this areas so thank you for those uh, very good presentation and then he covered it very well uh, all the points what is necessary and then also thank you for Joro uh, for your uh, submission as well so uh, on the whole okay it was a good presentation by both uh, mr felix and uh, mr atkinson for your wonderful preparation and presentation so now i just want to ask you uh, is there anything like you know uh, update on the term papers did you guys start i i spoke with one of my friend who is having a journal uh, if you write a term paper like a literature review or reviewing of any paper or a comparative analysis of any methods or techniques uh, he can publish for free okay uh, if you able to write without plagiarism they can publish your article did you guys start on the working on the term paper any update on that Yeah, we, we have identified the, we, we, we have, yeah, some of us have chosen the topics. We are, we are, yeah, we are trying to start on, on those. Yeah, if your paper is fine, okay, if your paper is fine, we can, we can uh, submit to some conferences and then, or any journal you want. But I have some journals in my mind where you can publish your paper for free. The only thing they're looking for is that it shouldn't be plagiarized. That's the only thing they want. They, they will uh, verify okay so please start working on that if you are not started i i really appreciate if you're able to work and then you can send your topic to my whatsapp uh, directly so that i can also look into that what you are looking for and then any anything you want i can always uh, you know uh, try to collect some papers for you so that which will be helpful for your review as well so see i, I given it's open-ended you can also have like you know uh, any kind of research like uh, you know comparative analysis reviewing or also you can also say like you know uh, existing frameworks or any security models you compare you can still do that are you able to propose some new method is still okay okay so please i request everyone to start and then you can send your topic directly to me so that i can see what best help i can do for you guys to complete that okay is there any other thing you want to discuss If not, shall we close the lesson today? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Felix. Thank, thank you, you, thank sir. you, everyone. We'll meet next time. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, okay, thank you. Have a good day.